Here's part one of a two-part interview with Paul Dickov, a Scottish striker probably best known for his time at Manchester City. However, today, you can hear him talk about starting off at Arsenal and, believe me, a very, very different Arsenal from the one we see right now. Paul will tell you about the list of teams who wanted him as he approached his 16th birthday and why his dad was so keen on urging him to leave the family home in Livingston in Scotland and go to London to change his life, to change his expectancy. Then it's George Graham, Pat Rice, Tony Adams, Ian Wright. You're going to love these stories. Gunnar or not, it's an inside view of the classic age of Arsenal. Before you hear them, I also want to tell you what Paul is up to now. He's mentoring children in the schools run by the Lawrence Trust in the Manchester area. The Lawrence Trust targets sporting as well as academic excellence. And Paul talks to children and teachers in groups and one-to-one about managing sporting development, diet, nutrition and laying pathways that give the kids at these free schools the best possible chance of being all they can be. We support him. Find out more, if you want, at laurastrust.co.uk. But for now, listen to this interesting, sharp, intelligent, funny storyteller who was once a fine professional footballer. So, the big interview doesn't usually start with me boasting. But I remember when I was allowed into the dressing room where the World Cup winning side was in 2010, I thought to myself, how many Scots? And then I had to count again (laughs) because my guest at the moment, Paul Dickhoff, is one of a hardy band of Scots who have played in a World Cup final, something to which we'll come in a second. Paul, thank you for doing the big interview. Thanks for having me. We only ever interview people that we admire and you spark that definitely from quite some time ago. But let's start by talking about, in this episode, we're going to try and tease out your beliefs and your mentality, yeah. attitude, which from my perspective, you had in abundance, matched with intelligence too. So if I, if I put to you, I haven't give you tons of examples of your own life, which you probably know quite well, that I saw not just a competitive mentality, but a bright mentality, and also somebody who, in given moments, given big moments in your career, had ice-cold mentality. Where did the thing that drove your professional career, talent aside, where did that come from? I don't know if it's the, the Scottish in me, my upbringing. Dad was a major influence on me from a young, young age. Always going on to me about being the best you can. Mm-hmm. How he would never, ever have a go at me for doing my best, for trying my hardest. I made mistakes or I wasn't good enough or things didn't quite well not just in football in my school work everything that I was doing and from quite an early age that was something that he, that he drummed into me and I remember that probably a big thing I was about 11 or 12 um, I was brought up a Celtic supporter mm-hmm. um, at that time in Scotland I had Celtic Rangers Aberdeen Dundee United Hibs Hearts all wanting me to go and train with them or to sign schoolboy forms wait, 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 wait. Aberdeen could have had you and with Sir Alex and Archie Knox um, was the manager we'll at the time. We'll come back to this. And we'll come back to the Sir Alex thing as well, him being manager at Aberdeen. And my dad to this, look, I was had a fantastic upbringing, mm-hmm. but not not the wealthiest, not mm-hmm. in the nicest area at some times. And my dad just had this thing that if I was going to have a professional career, which is crazy to say at 12, like looking back now, 11, 12, 13, because you, you never know what path you're going to go down, that he wanted to, well, bluntly get out of Scotland. I believe that I would benefit hugely of of getting away from the friendship group I was in at the time Mm -hmm. Um, away from any distractions and going away and actually leaving home and growing up and I was down at Man United on trials, I was here in Man City Gosh, Tottenham um, and Arsenal when I first went down when I was 12 years old. So there's a level of talent at 11-12 where not only do clubs want to test out the possibility of having your services but your dad knew, or at least your dad is thinking about a professional career. That's pretty astonishing. I think it was purely because of the interest in the amount of scouts okay. and the amount of clubs that were calling him up, you know, and that was something he never ever pushed me. He wasn't one of these dads that were living his dreams through no. me or anything like that, you know. I just think the phone on a Monday night, I would be at Helen Vale in Glasgow training with Aberdeen, 
on a Tuesday night I'll be, I think it was Harry Watt University, training with Hearts, and on Wednesday night I'll be in Edinburgh again, training with whoever, and you know, it was literally every night you'd be out, and then I'd play my school team on the Saturday, my boys club team on the Sunday, and that's, that's just the way it was. It does make me laugh now when I hear kids saying they're tired for the amount of football that they play, but that's... Because you'd have been different. six or seven competitive games a week. Yeah, and training, yeah, and mm. training. Um, but you loved that, it's all you knew. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you weren't doing that, you were out, you know, that literally was jumpers for goalposts, you know, you are out playing. I was, you know, right pain in the backside to my older brother, and hanging around <laughs> with his mates, and I always wanted to play football with them. And that, that was and they let you? Um, begrudgingly, yeah. Um, and how did they treat you once you did play? When I was younger, they used to kick 10 bales out of me, which I think toughened me up a little bit as well. Um, and that was usually my older brother as well, because he didn't want his, his little brother hanging on with his mates, and wasn't... Or showing him up. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that's just the way it was, and... I first went down to Arsenal when I was 12 and I realised then from me sort of 13, 14 being a biggish fish within the clubs in Scotland going down to Arsenal and it was every school holiday I would go down that I had a lot to do because the players that were there were, were so talented ability wise physique wise mm-hmm. compared to me at that time mm-hmm. um, quick strong because Arsenal had the best of everything else and the difference between Arsenal and when I went to the other clubs in England was, I remember going to Tottenham, um, I was back-to-back weeks, I must have been about 14. I spent one week at Tottenham and I think I played about five minutes football in actual game time because they had everybody there at the same time. There was about 40, 50 kids, all the same age group. Mm-hmm. When you went to Arsenal, they would stagger it. So there would be myself, maybe another lad from Scotland, a couple of lads from Ireland, one from Wales, maximum, that would integrate in with their under 14s that would be their academy. They could team, actually right? see you, they could watch and let you have some time to show whatever you had. Yeah, but you, you got every opportunity to go and do it, whereas at other clubs, I understand why. If everybody's mm. got the same school holidays and they want to have a look at everybody mm. from all over England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, there's, there's going to be. But it's kind of, from Spurs' point of view, and others who practice that, it's yeah. a kind of scattergun approach. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. You, you might miss a gem. Yeah, you know, and it's, it wouldn't happen now, no doubt about that. But that was the, the one thing that um, appealed me at Arsenal. Arsenal came um, to my parents when I was 14 and he couldn't sign schoolboy forms with an English club until you were 16. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just, no, nothing signed, nothing anything else, just at a good will would uh, stop training with the clubs I was doing in Scotland, stop going to other clubs and there would be an apprenticeship there when I was 16. You said two huge things, or at least it seems that way to mm-hmm. me. As I've gone on and learned in my life from my dad, you watch football, you listen to people. One that your dad at a young age said, so long as you're giving everything you've got, that you're trying to be the best you can, mm-hmm. I'll allow you scope for mistakes. Yeah. That's, I think that's quite far-sighted, and I also think it's quite unusual. Yeah, it is, and it's something I, I took with me all, all the way through to now, not just through my career. You know, and it's something I, I, I drum it into my kids, you know, just, if you can be the best you can all the time and work as hard as you can, you will make mistakes, but nine times out of ten, you'll, you'll get it right. But you've given them freedom to take creative risks. Yeah, and you've got to put yourself out there to do that, though. You know, and... and that's one of the, if you don't put yourself out there, nothing's going to happen. And the idea about it's necessary to break the patterns of either Scotland or where you were in Scotland, that's also quite firm because it effectively means goodbye to a son that I, for both your parents at a very young age. Yeah, it was, and it, look, it, was, it was difficult to start off with. You know, I've came from Livingston, a little town in Scotland, and all of a sudden I'm on my own I'm in London. And the first six months I hated it. I absolutely hated it because... For a couple of reasons. One, because I missed home, obviously. And mm-hmm. um, the second one, I was treading water because I very quickly realised, I know it started in the, the Youth World Cup, 1999, under 16, got to the final, scored the goal, the next big thing to come out of Scotland. And I remember going down to Arsenal pre-season and feeling so much out of my depth. Um, but it was the best thing that happened to me because I went down a little bit cocky. I've just scored the World Cup final, played in front of 70,000 people. And I soon realised in training that if I'd, if I'd rely purely on ability alone, I wasn't good enough to be in that environment. Because hmm. there were some unbelievable kids in Arsenal at mm-hmm. that time. year above us, Andy Cole mm-hmm. was probably the best example. Mm-hmm. And Ray Parler in my year. Um, and a lot of other very, very talented um, boys. And um, I was really struggling. And it all comes back to finding a way and being the best you can. And if I tried to match Andy Cole, mm-hmm. for instance, an ability goal scoring, if I tried to do what he, I couldn't do it. So I had to very quickly find a way, and it all goes back to the work ethic, closing people down, being horrible, being different from, from everybody else. 
You were that self-analytical then. I'm not saying that you, you know that this comes to you retrospectively. Yeah. You, you were, you know, in the lonely time um, in digs or wherever. You were going through your own head about the things that you had to add or change to, to keep up or to, to overtake yeah, others. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Because I think spending a lot of time on your own in digs in a room, you probably have too much time to, to it reflect. It can go one of yeah, two ways. Exactly. Yeah. I and mean, a big turning point for me was we played, still the first year we played Chelsea at London Colney, um, South East Counties game, and I was sub. Mm -hmm. um, first year, struggling a little bit. But I was beginning to get a little bit, I hope people say throughout my career, I did a little bit of anger issues on the pitch and in training, and, but it was through frustration of me not being at the level that the other ones were at. Um, and I was on the pitch about two minutes, balls went over the top, and it was Frank, Frank Sinclair, funnily enough. Um, I, th I think come in, Franks came from nowhere, um, and I just lost my head. And, <laughs> and looking back, it was funny. It wasn't funny at the time. I just booted him up the bum. Mm -hmm. the ball was nowhere. I just didn't. I was just that frustrated. And <laughs> yeah, no. I, and, I think the rush of frustration. I think anybody can understand that. Yeah. Not, not everybody does it. Yeah. But I think you're ringing a bell with everybody listening. Yeah, and, and Pat, um, Pat Rice, who's oh. youth team manager, huge influence on me. Rice yeah. he took me straight off. Well, I must have been in the pitch about two minutes. Mm. And we had a chat with all the staff, and they basically said, "Look, you're here for a reason. We rate you, but you keep doing what you're doing at the minute. We're sending you home." Mm. Now, loads of things were going through my head. Then one, I didn't want to let my dad down. No, <laughs> I didn't want to let Arsenal down because they were taking this chance on me. And the embarrassment of going back to my mates at a young age when mm -hmm. played in the World Youth Cup final, contract to Arsenal, he's moving away, he's going on to bigger things, and then having to go back and explain why at a young age I didn't mm -hmm. want that to happen. And that's when the penny, the penny dropped, and everything I was doing in training, in games, and mentally, I had, I had to change. Well, I don't want to be over analytical, but it's given that you were that bright at that age about yourself and about your career and about your surroundings, did you have any idea then that you still had to retain some of that genie in a bottle? That, that yeah, but some of that was going to yeah. serve you as you went on. And that's something Pat Rice used to speak to me about all the time as a youth team player. He said, "Look, we never ever." ever want to take that away from you. Mm. We've just got to channel it in the right direction. And realise that when you do channel it right, that sometimes, all right, you might not be able to do things with the ball that other players can do, mm. but you're as important, if not more important, to the team when you're doing that. Because people, when you channel it right and you do it right, people don't like playing against you and mm. you'll have a long career. And I remember George Graham at the time, I didn't, quite know what he meant but he had a conversation with me about how I'd have a long career in football never said at Arsenal mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think he he probably knew as much as I was in the squad a lot and George introduced me to the first team and he loved having me around it I think maybe that level at that time when I mean, there was the rights the bear camps and everything else mm -hmm. um, but if I kept going the way I was going I, I would end up having a long career in the game you, you may, I'm jumping aside and come back because I saw in this city a couple of months ago I was over at <coughs> the other side, mm -hmm. and um, they've got something called the cage at Carrington, where the idea is that 14, 15 year olds are given a kind of all in game. The ball's never out of play. It's at least eight, possibly 11 a side. So it's not like five a side with the ball off the walls, but it's in play all the time and it's quick. And while it's refereed, the idea is that it's, it's supposed to reproduce a little bit of street football's yeah. attitude. There was one guy who was an astonishing. And there'd been a couple of hefty tackles and he took the ball and he drifted past his full back and in the same movement of the ball tied to his foot, did him. Just say, there you go, don't mess with me. And I saw the coaches who'd set up this atmosphere saying, oh yeah, I'm not like that. And then you're off because yeah. they had to say, that's too much, you're off. But they were they to show bobbling with. But they loved it. Oh, and that's the, that's the right stuff. But yeah. like with you, also, when, when you're told, when you're full of testosterone and will yeah. to win and you're told, you know, don't kick him out the bum or whatever it is, or, how do you, how, it's all very well now saying Pat told you channel it. How do you do that? Because that comes with maturity, um, which you're not well, really I, supposed to have at 16. I had to grow up very quickly. And I think um, being away from home, being in, being in London, you know, I'm saying it was the world's apart from where I got brought up in. I think you have to get streetwise very quickly, and you have to grow up very quickly. Otherwise, you just get lost. Did Livingston make you streetwise? You said uh, there were things to move yeah, away from. Yeah, look, I had, I had mates that were, were wrongings, or probably a little bit of a wronging myself at times. You know, and 
was I the model child? Was I the model kid in school? No, I wasn't. I was in trouble quite a lot, actually. But that's not something that I felt I took down, took down to London with me. And I completely understand my dad's reasons for wanting to do it, because the mates I was playing football with, the mates I was growing up with, were either ended up not doing very well for themselves or still doing the exact same thing now as what they were doing when they were 13, 14, 15. It's an impressive and, thought, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's a bright, it was some guy, your mm -hmm. father in that case. You're also in an atmosphere where you, we have to talk about Pat, we have to talk about George. Pat I know less, George I know very well yeah. indeed. How, to what degree did you have to mix with some of the all-time characters of British football? Very, very quickly. And th this is what separates, and go back a little bit as well, um, separated Arsenal from everybody else. You know, I remember um, going down with my mum and dad and Terry Murphy, who was, what a guy, overseeing Arsenal's youth system for, it seemed like forever, would take you out. And all of a sudden you would bump into um, David Rocastle at the stadium. David would, it was all pre-planned, thinking back now. Ah, okay. David Rocastle would come over, oh, how are you doing? This is a great club, God bless him, what a guy. Yeah. Um, Loved by everybody. Speak to parents. And even the, the senior pros, when you were in that environment, were always like that. When you were one-on-one -on -one with them and the advice they got, I know they took the Tony Adams, the Merce, the Bolds, the, every single one of them were big, big characters. Mm. Maybe they helped you. They helped you by talking about being cruel to be kind sometimes. You know, talking about kids nowadays not cleaning boots and mm -hmm. cleaning the changing rooms. I used to have a mini panic attack whenever I walked in the first team dressing room. Two at one, because you were that scared of them. I think that's fair. And two, you had that much respect for them yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, and they were up there and that's where you wanted to go. You know, and you used to walk in and you used to pick the boots up and you'd get a slap in the head. You'd get somebody would boot you up the bomb and somebody yeah. would say, what are you doing? Get out of here. You're not in the first team. There. All that sort of stuff. So everything combined, it toughens you up. It's an atmosphere it that it. can't exist today. Unfortunately, it, it actually I think wouldn't be allowed. But there's a certain level of it <laughs> that can't, but I, I think there's certain things that you could take out of it without, without a shadow of a doubt. Because mm. you speak to anybody, not just in that youth team at the time, but anybody that went through that as a player, that they'll say there's some of the best times of your career. Mm. You know, the camaraderie, you got your teammates, and you had to go back on a Friday afternoon and clean the changing rooms, get the kit out, get the boots out. Then after a match day, everybody's gone home, you're scrubbing the floors, tiles, toilets, you know, and if they're not done right, Pat Rice would have us in at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning to redo it all again. You know, so that discipline side of it, that you don't realise at the time, the togetherness it gives you with your teammates. So tell well. us a little bit about Pat, because um, given that I'm older than you, I remember Pat as fullback, mm -hmm. Sammy Nelson, I think, in the, probably in the yeah. double winning side. Yeah. At one stage, he'd have probably been at or near all-time appearances yeah. for Arsenal, kind of Mr. Arsenal, Kept by Arsene, and therefore, if he's not still there, it's very recent. And yeah, I think maybe yeah, he's still, he's still, still there. there. But he, he's not a very public character. No, he doesn't not. speak in, in public very often. Paint a picture of Pat Rice and who he is and what he did for you and what kind of man he is. Uh, very hard man, but with a, with a soft side to him as well. He knew, even his kids, he knew how to get the best out of each individual one. He would, he would look after you with his life, whether he liked you as a person or not, to try and give you the best pathway your, that you could get in your career. You know, he would, he would bollock you, mm -hmm. and he would properly bollock you. Mm -hmm. um, I remember him taking me off in an FA Youth Cup game, and I swore at him, and just in the heat of the moment again, and it was, I was never been so scared in my life in the changing room afterwards, because he told me to shred, and he was right. He was right, and he would, and I made sure it was something I'd never ever done again, mm -hmm. all the way through my career. Irishman? Irishman, yeah. Um, funny? Very funny as well. You know, he had a bit of everything to him. A fantastic coach. Fantastic ah. coach. But you, you look at the players he produced. You know, yeah. I've already spoke about Merce, David Rocastle, Michael Thomas, um, Martin Hayes in the first team, Tony Adams, and Ray Parlin, who I played with, you know, and Stephen Morrow, Ian Settle. You know, the, the amount of players that Pat produced that went on to win big trophies, it must be up there with the best. Phenomenal. And that's because uh, he grounds you, and mm. he coaches you well, and he, he teaches you how to be a footballer more than anything else. And he was working for it, although you must have started going down with Terry Neal, big boss, when you first went down. Because you, yeah. going down at that age, you predated yeah. George by... Terry and Donau. Ah, Don Donau yeah. was a coach, too. Yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, even though you were a schoolboy, Pat Rice would take your training. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, sure, it wasn't an under-14 yeah. coach or under-13. Did you, did you know who he was at that stage? 
a bit, by just by name, maybe? The first time I went down, um, obviously, you, you find out about the scout that brings you down and tells you this is what's going to be happening. Um, but then to have the boost as a young kid, to have the, the youth team manager that's coming to take you, you know, it was loads of little things that, that Arsenal done properly. Mm. You know, it's about best, not just football education, probably life education that, that I've got. George Graham, because Pat and George were teammates in the Dublin Georges. You know, George is Hollywood, George is elegance, isn't he? Yeah. George, one of the things that we found out, I don't know if you know this, but George and Terry Venables were so close that George was best man to Terry in his wedding on the Saturday morning of a North London derby. Mm, that's right, yeah. And then George went out and story. spanked Terry 4 yeah, right. <laughs> You're like, it's like something out of Butch and Sundance. It's okay. definitely from the Hollywood era. But like spruce and elegant, oh, and strong and bright and yeah. intelligent. Give, give us your picture Talk. of George Graham then. Um, now or then? Definitely. Let's start with then because I suspect it's a changed yeah, picture. Just uh, utmost respect. You know, even from a young age. I think when you're in the youth team and you look how much the first team players respect the manager mm. and listen to the manager, you know that the guy's some something special. You know, he was he was very hard. I must have. Admit, and I've never spoke to him about this, you might ask him, he did have a little soft spot for me. Okay. I think the Scottish boy mm. coming down to England, 16, he done the same thing. Yeah. You know, so I think he, he knew the sort of things I was going through. It was tough on me. Uh-huh. But I knew it, he liked my attitude and my enthusiasm and my love for the game and, and the fact I was so focused and wanting to be a footballer. You know, he never came out and told me that, but I, I knew that that was the one thing that he liked about me. Because he had the first team feeling as you had felt about the first team. Yeah. I think right. Tony called an eye at all, I think, and they were scared to go in and ask for extra money. Yeah. And George was very canny. He always seemed to be a step ahead of them all the time. Yeah, and um, I remember, I think it was my first professional contract. It was YTS then, so the first year I was on £27.50. Second year, I got the raise to 35 quid. I, mean, I, thought, I thought I was minted. Come on. You know, and, um, I'd still take that. And I got the call to manager back at the stadium right. um, and as any young pro did do I'm not so much they do it now they go to the senior pros and ask their advice sure give me the numbers now whether the, the lads were taking a complete piss out of me or not I don't know so I went and spoke to them and they're saying look we'll tell you what the gaffer will do now it's your first contract he'll offer you £200 a week don't take it go and ask for five um, from 27 £35 £35 he said, I asked for five, settle for four, but he, he does it, he done it to me, he done it to him, look at him, look at him, they're all going, yep, same thing, same thing, same thing. So I've travelled back from London Colony, back to Highbury, can't even, say it was two o'clock, I had to see the gaffer, walked in, walked up the marble staircase, up to his office, and, and he had a, his door for the office was bigger than this room. <laughs> right, and I've chapped, and he's, wait. <laughs> so I'm sitting outside, and I'm thinking, go on, five, five. <laughs> Must have been sitting there for about an hour. <laughs> and I know for a fact now, he <laughs> wasn't cr- doing it. Doing the crossword. Yeah, he was probably sitting reading the paper or, or something else. Eventually I went in, and I swear to God, I've walked in, right, and he's got this. At the time, it looked like an altar for his desk. <laughs> and this big, massive chair that's up here. Yeah. And he's went, sit down. <laughs> and then the little nursery chairs, yeah. Yeah, that's what it was yeah. like. Yeah. So I went in. <laughs> I'm sitting like this. I'm peeking up. And he, he went, I'll give you two years at £200 a week. I went, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and turned around and walked straight back out again. But that's the thing. Oh, We've got to admire that in retrospect. Absolutely. That is genius, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Oh, man. You know, whether they'd done that with everybody else. <laughs> they did it with Tony. Or, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it was, it was genius. Oh, you know, that was and, fabulous. But away from all that, it wasn't, I'm not CZ, it wasn't about the money. I was just so glad that mm. I was getting involved in the first team squad a lot more as a kid. And yeah, to have his faith, to have him saying you'll for him to give me a now. professional contract where a lot of the lads who were saying were more talented than me in the team, mm. we weren't getting them, you know. We're coming back to Arsenal, but let's take a jump because I did. <sighs> You've already answered my question about mentality. Brilliantly, I'm not used to being carpet pulled from underneath me in the first 15 minutes of the chat. But, you know, anybody of my age was vaguely aware of you at Arsenal, but at that stage, you know, I think you were still a year or two away from our first team debut. Yeah. And for whatever reason, FIFA have the common sense to put a world tournament in Scotland, part of which was at Pataudry. I know what I want to get from you about your feelings or your um, reactions to the moments, but... Was it as special as you would imagine in, in that 
a World Cup is or even a European Championship for which Scotland used to qualify. Part of the magic is probably going to a foreign country, seeing all the things you've never seen before, that excitement of being invaders in a foreign country. But you're at home. Yeah. Is that good or bad um, to be you know, living in normal conditions, basically back home for a World Cup? Um, we didn't really think about it. Oh. Honestly, we'd been, um, and I look back at now, we'd, the European Championship just before which were held in Denmark, which, which was a great experience because we'd done the travelling thing, we were away together, it was a proper camp that yeah. we were doing. Um, and it was obviously all done with the lead up to, to the World Cup. So when we went and made our base um, at Largs, at the time, um, we went there and we were all together for two weeks. We just had that bit of difference. You know, it wasn't anything, anything new. And if anything, it wasn't. We weren't at home every day. I think we get let home twice over the course of the two weeks. But it was just brilliant. You mm. know, we just we, we were a group of lads that loved playing football, and I think that showed. And that's one of the reasons we went as, as far as we went in the tournament. It, it took a little bit of time for the for the buzz to grow in the country, didn't it? Yeah, crowds? I remember we played Ghana in the first game at Hamden. And I think there was about six or seven thousand there. You know, maybe that's shouldn't have been played at Hamden. Maybe they should have took it to the second game is Fur Park, yeah. where we played. Is it Bahrain? No. Bahrain. Next two games were at Fur Park. Crowd was there was about seven thousand there again, but smaller. Feels not bad. Yeah, and then Cuba was the, the third game at Fur Park, and I don't know what the crowd was, but it looked as if it was full. You know, and then. Obviously, we qualified, which was great, and we just went on the crest of a wave after that. You know, we didn't expect to get out the group. Never mind. Really? Yeah, that, that sounds. The Bahrain team were fantastic footballers. Hmm. Um, the Ghana team, they were the up and coming kid called Neil Lampte. Ooh, what a what player. a player he yeah. was! But at that age as well, you know. So the, the Ghanaians had a lot of big names, even though it was supposed to be under 16 youth World Cup. So we just went with it. And, had a go and you know obviously Craig Brown was a was a manager and Ross Matthew and they just kept giving us the confidence to go out and play, go and play, go and play, enjoy the crowd and no pressure on you, nobody's expecting anything. And before we knew it we were playing in front of thirty thousand at Tyne Castle against Portugal. Well, that's the semi final, eh? Yeah. Now that, because by that I stage. I won't miss Pataudry out in the yeah, quarter okay. final, it's all right. Don't. So, was that East Germany? East yeah. Germany, yeah. So, Pataudry, obviously a raucous welcome. It yeah. feels like the Maracan yeah. Beautiful <laughs> night by the sea, yeah. or not. But Tyne Castle is different, because you've presented it very matter of factly, yeah. very cleanly and clearly up to now. But my memory serves me well. Tyne Castle is buzzing, it's difficult to get to, the atmosphere yeah. is fantastic. But we're late getting to the no. game because the crowds. It was just, it was phenomenal. It was just that everybody came out. You know, Scotland's in this Youth World Cup semi final and playing against Portugal. And some of the names that Portugal team had in the, that went on to a little Lewis Figo. Let's, let's pick one. Yeah, Figo. It was the one, um, Abel Javier Chavier, yeah. as well, centre yeah. half that yeah. day. And we'd actually stayed in the same base as the Portuguese at the European Championship in Denmark. Okay. And we watched them play in games and they were some team. Um, but we just thought, you know what, we'll go out there. We're Scottish, don't expect to be here. Kick them, harry them, force them into mistakes. And, and that's what happened. But the crowd, back to the crowd, there was, I think there was 6,000 locked out, 30,000 in. There was people on the roof watching the game. And it was just, you know, such a special night going into that. Did your family and friends there? Everybody was there, yeah. yeah. Everybody was there. And um, then you've got, before you know it, Brian O'Neill scores 1-0, and we actually deserve to win the game. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're 15 and under 16, and you're going to a World Cup final in, 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 your, in your own country. There's a tale to tell about that, but I think, you know, given that you're so honest, that at that stage, internet, I don't know if it even exists. No. You, at that stage, Figo hasn't won the Ballon d'Or. He's not Real Madrid Figo, yeah. he's a man Figo. Did he stand out? Did you go, uh, did he, that's the 17? Or also, you know, he famously was sort of a child of the 60s when he mm-hmm. won the world title with the hair down here. Did he stand out at that stage? Or, or because, not, no, I wonder if he You wouldn't not. have said then that he was the one that said would have went and done it. He just looked like an able footballer at yeah, that stage. Yeah, good footballer and really nice lad as well. You know, totally yeah. being in that same base in the European Championship. There was a degree of 16. camaraderie and mixing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but you wouldn't have said he would have been the one that was going to be the world superstar that he was. Well, in the podcast with him, we'll ask him what happened. Yeah. So, the Hamden has to be a bittersweet tale. Um, but let's go to sweet. Because 
when we looked at you, both of us reacted a little bit to, I'd put it in my words as pigeonholing. Yeah. You've used a couple of phrases about nasty and kicking and chasing, I don't know, okay, fine. But what we continually saw was football intelligence and a work ethic and a mentality. Yeah. At least that's what I think I saw, a winner's mentality. Yeah. And you get your goal from a mix of everything that's you yeah. at hand, and, and I'll let you describe it. But I, I remember it's being 50% dogged, I, I know what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to let the situation get away from me because that ball's not mine. And then when you get the ball, again, in my view, I think you do something pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. So take us back to, to where we're at in the match. Scotland are 1-0 one up. 1-0 one up, at, um, Ian Downey. Against... Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I got an assist, Ian Downey's header, and then I hadn't scored all tournament. I thought I'd done, I played really, really well. I missed chances, I was unlucky, and, and there was this big thing going into the final about me not scoring in the tournament yet. Then I remember the ball, got played down the channel, chased the centre half down, centre half slipped. It was The centre half was that far in front of me, the goalkeeper was already sort of coming out for them to pass it back where they could. Pick Don't do yourself a disservice. Say he's got the ball, yeah. and you, you're a good bit back, and it, yeah. he should have been smoking a cigar. Yeah, I think he was old, he was old enough to. Haven't he? <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't yeah. rushed that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've, I've nicked the ball off him, and then, you know, the people say to me, and they say this about a lot of goals. What do you remember about it? What was going through your head? Uh, it's just instinct, a lot of it. But your angle's not no great. I, I, I could see it was off his line, but it was also out his box as well. Mm. So. Um, if I can say I thought I'm going to chip him because his ear is there, I, I would be lying. It just it just happened and something you know, takes over. It. Yeah, it does. It does, and it's it's weird to explain to him. You know, it just happens, and then sometimes afterwards you think, how did I do that? Mm-hmm. You know, when you see it back, and because yeah. I, I also think, and whether it's more just your memory, I do think you're underplaying it a little bit because when you pick the ball up, you're fairly far away, yeah. right? Even though instinct takes over and he's a little bit off his yeah. line, you can't see a lot of the yeah. goal. Um, it's quite an oblique angle to the right with yeah. the goal diagonally to you, not in front of you. And it wasn't like the goal that um, Villarreal scored at the Bernabeu, mm-hmm. um, where your front on the keeper's off and you approach it and it's just an up and down. You know, it's not an easy Sunday yeah. bunker shot. It's a really tough well, shot. That's what I, but I used to, I used to work. I used to do my finishing all the time, uh-huh. all the, even from a from a young age. You know, if I, I knew that. I loved scoring goals, <laughs> you know, and I loved being in that position to do it. And even at an under 16 level, I firmly believe that me being out with a ball at my feet every day that I could made, makes that these sort of things happen, you know, because because you work at it and you practice it and you you visualise things in your head and mm. you know you want to be. But I wanted to be Kenny Dalglish when I was a kid, you know, the nice. best one of the best players ever, not just mm-hmm. Scottish players. And I would, I would watch how he would do things and I would go out and try and do the same things. And, and then I, th- I do believe you, you get the benefits from it. And, you know, that goal at a young age in a World Cup final, I th- do think it stems from that. And I'll go back and say, did I, did I know what I was doing? Did I think I've got to chip it? No, I, I didn't. It just, it just happens and it's, it's hard to explain. So sort of Gary played Jackie Stewart the harder I work the luckier yeah, I get. Yeah, absolutely. So matches can come and go, and, and Scotland are two up, and it ends two two. Yeah. Um, the first thing to say is that retrospectively, there's been a bit of a hoo-ha, and we've joked about it about the ages of the Saudi yeah. players, and there have been accusations that they, that they cheated and yeah. some the evidence of your own eyes or, or, or what they were like on the day. What were you thinking, or what were any routine? I remember thinking walking out the tunnel and standing beside them before the game and thinking they are massive. They are massive. Being honest, at the time, was I thinking they must be 25? We weren't. We just thought they were a big, powerful team, which we knew. We knew they would come on strong towards the end of the game. But regardless if they were 17, 18, 19, I mean, there's been accusations of some of them were 25. Mm, I've seen that one. You know, we should have won the game, regardless. Ah. 2-0 up. They get back to 2-1. We miss a penalty. We should have went three. Game over. Game over. And we were good enough up until a point to have won that game quite comfortably. The fact that they got back in the last 10, 15 minutes was purely they were physical, they were fitter, they were bigger, they were stronger than us. And we tired through the exertions that we'd done previously. But away from all that, we, we should have won that game. It's a brilliant no mentality. Yeah. So does that leave you with, 
less of a soreness about not having had that medal because you know that whatever they did, even if they did bend the rules a little yeah. bit, it, it was within your own grasp. At least you haven't just sort of been outright yeah. robbery. We're 2 0 up going into the second half. And as I say, Brian O'Neill, bless him, you know, a young, he misses a penalty in the 90 minutes and then misses the penalty that causes in the penalty shootout. You know, and talking about mentality for Brian at a young age to come back from that and go and have the career they had is bang on. Aberdeen legend. Yep, he is that. Nice man, too. Very nice yeah, man. man. Successful in the Bundesliga, too. Yeah, very well. So, so hats off to Brian, a really nice fella. So you go back to Arsenal. This isn't going to be a life in chronology, yeah. but I think it's bookends. Yeah. How are you treated? Did English fellas dig you up a little bit? Because if they didn't, and I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the one thing I can remember going back there was Theo Foley, who was assistant manager at the time, coming over and congratulating me. Obviously, the gaffer was buzzing that um, Scotland had done so well. A lot of the first team players hadn't watched it. A lot of them didn't even know about it. You know, because at that time, they were all on holiday. You know? Okay. You know, it's close season and... I suppose it's not like now where you can go into yeah. any bar anywhere in the world and you can Fair watch point. the Premier League Fair and you point. can watch any game that you want. The only player that mentioned it um, was Quinny, Niall Quinn. All right. And lovely guy anyway, Smash Quinny. Um, and he came over to him and made a big thing about it. And he was, I said, I was sitting in a bar in my bear or wherever it was. They said, and I'm sitting on the holidays and I look up and I see, I see you playing. What a goal you scored, well done. And, da, 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 and, and that straight away you're like... Feels good. Yeah, because senior pro you look up to. Because there were two of you in that squad. James Will. Three, Scott Marshall. Scott was also Scotty, Marshall. yeah. yeah. Oh, well, so if it came to sort of a standoff, it could have been 3v3 if anyone yeah. been taking a piss. <laughs> exactly. And you, you go back then, in that case, what probably a little bit more determined. A little bit more determined. Probably a little bit too cocky, if I'm being honest. And, you know, that maybe it's a little bit back to front, this, but the. the Pat Rice incident when he took me off mm-hmm. that was all around the same time that it all just happened after because when I, I signed for Arsenal on the 1st of January 1989 I actually left school early and I had that from the January to the May in 1989 as a set on in period if, if you know what I mean mm-hmm. um, Scott and Jim weren't there my year group was the next year group that was coming in if that makes any sense it does, total. so when I went back that pre-season that was my first real Real time there, if it, you know. It was I mean. beginning again, even yeah. though you'd been there for. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. And I probably went back as a cocky little Scotsman thinking, mm-hmm. do you know what? I've, 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 looking back now, I'd probably think, do you know what? I've made it here. Yeah, Arsenal just scored a World Cup final, and, and hence all the other things started to happen. So once the re education helps you, 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 you do be, begin to make an impact and, and you do begin to play for Arsenal. Um, is it because. It wasn't meant to be. Is it because the competition you faced was outrageous? Is it because of outside elements that you didn't do maybe five, six, seven years as an Arsenal first team player? Because it does seem in retrospect that it it could have been that way. You could have probably, what you proved later in your career, attitude, work ethic, ability to score, team mentality, it could have happened. Yeah, I got to the point where I was 20, 22. Um, obviously, George had left, Bruce Reoc had, had come in. Um, then Bruce had left, Arsenal was taken over. And talking about that actual time, I had to realise I was 22, I'm not a regular in the first team. I'm not playing, I played, I think I'd made about 16, 17 starts, 20 odd sub appearances, travelling with the squad, being 15th man, whatever it was mm. at the time, on the bench, off the bench. And in cup games coming out, and uh, deep down I knew that at some point I was going to, I was going to have to move on. It was difficult because all my working career, all my from when I was sixteen, seven years, living on my own, growing up, life experiences, football education, had all been at Arsenal. I didn't mm-hmm. know anything different. But it came to a point where I, I just wanted to play, you know, and I just wanted to make a career for myself. And if I'd stayed any longer, I don't think I would have done. You know, Arson was just taking over. I don't. Well, if you remember at the time, he was Grand Pissé. Mm-hmm. He had to finish his contract at Grand Pissé, although he'd been announced as Arsenal manager. That's right. And through Stuart Houston, who was the caretaker at the time, Stuart came to me and said, look, Arsenal would like you to stay. He wants to say good things about you. I've obviously spoke. He wants to have a good look at all players, Gosh. not just yourself. 
but he does realise because I've, I've been speaking to Stuart Jordy Armstrong God bless him as well oh, another legend um, yeah, yeah. So, what, like, like Rocky so what, what, what a guy how, how did you come into so much contact with him Jordy was my reserve team manager okay. for about four seasons mm -hmm. just brilliant we used to argue like Mm -hmm. um, in training he used to cheat all the time the ball would be five <laughs> yards out and if he was joining in he would play on and do you know what I mean and I think that's good for you it was, it was brilliant and I'd been speaking to Jordy and Stuart a lot and just saying I, just, I need to go and play now you know and, and they were agreeing with me and Stuart said Arsenal's not going to they'll leave the decision down to you mm. um, and I was actually getting ready to leave Colney to go down and talk sign for Southampton under Graham Souness and Jordy called me and said, look, um, Alan Ball has just called me from Man City. And I knew whether Alan Ball called Jordy or Jordy because we got on so well and he had a soft spot for me. Probably called Bolly, I think. Looking out for you a little bit. And saying, look, nice. he's, he's nice. going down just to mark your card. I know you like him. There you go. And before I knew it, I was in Mottram Hall with Franny Lee and Alan Ball signing the contract. And that was just as, as quickly as it happened. Before we leave Arsenal, there's two things. Did you, you've got a Cup Winners Cup medal? Yeah. What do you think of it? Is it is it mine? Is it not mine? Is it? Um, it's, Footballers it's think about these of, things differently. Yeah, and I, it's something. Look, I'm proud. I'm so proud of it. But I, I, I never made an appearance in the tournament, you know. But it all goes back to I, I genuinely believe hard work, you know. And the six weeks previous. To the actual final, I was playing for Brighton in the Ultra Division on loan cool. at the Goldstone. You know, and I'd actually played against Fulham uh -huh. on the Saturday. Um, obviously, the Fulham, not the Fulham that used to be or are now, they, they were struggling. Mm -hmm. Scored two goals in front of a packed Goldstone. What a ground! I have so great memories of there for the short space of time. And got a phone call to say I was getting called back because I was in the European Cup Winners' Cup final squad on the Tuesday night. So from the Saturday playing in the Division Three to to the European final against traveling the to Copenhagen. fabulous Parma side yeah. and then back to Denmark. Yeah, Copenhagen um, um, and the squad and I, I did think somebody was taking the piss. You know the old yeah good one on the phone. Um, <laughs> before I knew it, I was on the on the plane to to Copenhagen. Did the mentality click in? I might be called upon. This might be my moment. I or? didn't think for one second I was going to be in the squad. As in the actual make the bench mm. you know and I remember George naming the subs in the team meeting and I wasn't even I think I was in dreamland so I was thinking about something else it, just pure honestly expecting my name not to be there and the last name the sub was, was Paul Dickov you know, at which point I was buzzing in the adrenaline yeah I was I couldn't wait to get there you know I think I was out in the pitch in Copenhagen warming up about four hours before everybody else I just couldn't wait to <laughs> get out there and you know the fans were singing my name behind the goal as I was taking shots into the goal before Come you know, on. I was living the dream you know it was, no way yeah and, well that's, that makes the, that makes know, the medal but, shine a little bit yeah, more brightly but, but it also it just shows you that anything can happen yeah you know I'm willing to bet it's an easy bet to make but I'm willing to bet that had you been called on you'd been ready that day oh yeah absolutely and my memory of that side was Arsenal weren't really supposed to, to win. win. No, because the Zolas, the Sprias, the team. Oh, I could play. The team could had really had fantastic. Play. Yeah. That performance that day was just heroic. It, to me, it spoke of the majority of the European performances from the British sides over the previous, yeah. previous couple of decades. It doesn't matter about the odds or how good the others hit. There's something about our unity, work rate, mentality. It was also quite, it was one of George's yeah. defensive days. Yeah. Uh, yeah man, his tactics were brilliant, as they always were. You know, and the actual game itself, I can't remember much about because I think I warmed up for 90 minutes. I was knackered at the end of it. I was just that <laughs> desperate to get I kept running past George. I just, <laughs> Gather, I'm here already, sort of thing. You know, but getting called up and put in that squad mm -hmm. was, I remember George, I remember Stuart saying to me that was a reward for how hard I'd been working. You know, and if you look back with George, he'd done it with Steve Morrow, he'd done it with Ray Parler, FA Cup. League Cup final didn't end up well for Steve but no, no, I know but there was always a youngster yeah. that get put in the bench and Brilliant. that was his way of saying I'm damn glad that you feel that way yeah. about the experience I really yeah. am because obviously it's not everything that you'd have wanted for yourself in that moment At that but time, it's everything that everybody who's listening to this wants yeah no, no it was yeah of course it was mm. you know if I hadn't had that time at Arsenal I doubt I would have been on to if the career I would have had you know because the, the characters I was dealing with well, I can't leave Arsenal without one of them. Of all the people that you've talked about, did, did Ian Wright 
Brilliant. Well, that's what um, influence you, help you, hugely. drive you mad, make you laugh. Everything, everything. I love them to bits. Um, but the right, he couldn't play mm -hmm. um, in the final, so I, I did. I offered right in my medal. Oh, I didn't um, know that after the game. Yeah, that's a fabulous gesture. Because um, as I said before, I hadn't even kicked a ball in the tournament. Yeah. yeah. I seen how devastated right he was when he got his booking against PSG, knowing that he was going to miss the final in the semi final. And he was just a huge, huge influence. He they fathered me, slapped me about a bit, took the piss out of me, but loved me at the same time. Um, and the biggest thing that happened at Arsenal for me that I took all through my career was, was my right. Um, I was finished training at London Colony, dressed, walking over for lunch. And right, he's walking, it's hard to imagine what Colney was like, right, he's walking back out to the training pitches and he's got two bags of balls over his shoulder, 20 balls in each. And he went to me, where are you going? Mm -hmm. And I went, I'm just sort of laughed and said, I'm going for lunch. And he went, no, you're not. He said, you're not good enough. And he went, go and get training kit on and come out with me. Unbeknown to me and maybe a lot of his teammates at the time, every day, most days, he would go out on his own with two bags of balls and just hit the back of the net. No goalkeeper. No opposition, no nothing. So we went out and he would hit the ball from 20 yards, 18, 6, 2 yards. And just. And I remember him saying once at that time, he took a shot and he's, and he's, he's went, did you hear that? And I was thinking, he's daft, there's nobody here. And he went, did you hear that? And I went, what? He went, the ball hitting the back of the net. Swish. He said, it's the best sound ever. So what that taught me, going back to my digs that day, was that this is... Best striker in the Premier League at the time. He just won the European Golden Boot. England's goal scorer. Best, I know there's sheer or best natural instinctive goal scorer there was at the time. There was a big difference between the two of them. Yep. I know who I'd pay to watch. Yep. Righty. Yep, 100%. Um, and he stays out every day doing that. Mm -hmm. Why does he do it? So when you heard tales latterly about the Cantona effect on the class of 92, yeah. you understood it immediately. Oh, 100%, because right, you used to do that anyway. Here's a strange picture for people that, that haven't lived through this. I, when I first moved to Barcelona, Ronaldinho um, was signing, and in those days, the pitch next to the camp now, it was where you could watch them training. And Ronaldinho used to go down on his own, he used to do like righty, and he would, they wouldn't give him a goalkeeper. Yeah. He'd ask for a goalkeeper, they'd go back, don't be stupid. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why he didn't bully, he didn't, didn't do a righty on yeah. it. The club wasn't set up to help Ronaldinho, what Ferran Soriano called yeah. a rock and roll signing. Mm -hmm. So they knew what to do in signing him, they knew who to play him with, uh, they knew how to market him, but nobody supported him. Yeah. So at that stage, nobody at Arsenal was saying, brilliant, right, he's going out, we'll get, the junior keeper will be, we'll be there, we'll, we'll make everything. You know it was all on you. It was all on you to do it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I don't know if you went to a coach or you went to, if I went to Bob Walsh, the goalkeeping coach, and go, can I do some up with your keepers today? He would stay out and they would do it with you. I said to Pat Rice, I need to work on this. They, they would come out and do it with you, but a lot yeah. of it, you just, you done it yourself. No. Kids nowadays. That's the motif. The whole, whole career thing is, yeah. do, it, do it yourself, do it right, yeah. do it over Absolutely. and over again, do it yourself. Yeah, and, and that day with right, it was, it was just brilliant for me going through my career. It's fabulous because here, at this, we're, we're at Manchester City right now, here Pep will be talking to, and the Spanish players who are really, really good, all talk about automatismos. Mm -hmm. Automatismo means something becomes automatic. Yeah. And, and it just happens, and usually for the good. Yeah, absolutely. And from that day on, every day after training, I used to have managers screaming at me to come in on a Friday. And I'd say, no, I need to. And Mark, Mark Hughes and Mark Bowen was at Blackburn used to say to me, just don't do anything, you've worked hard enough this week. But on the, on the basis that you might use all your powder. Yeah. And Which you could say it about running. Uh, yeah. But, but not about skills. No, I would do it properly. Skills. I would do it properly in a Friday. It was match pace, it was intensive, it was sprints, it was... I needed to come off the training ground knowing I was sweating, knowing I'd done what I needed to do. Um, because and knowing that it wouldn't affect me on the Saturday. So thank you to Mr Paul Dickoff for the interview and for the off-microphone follow-up in Rincon de Rafa in the Deansgate, Manchester that followed this podcast recording. Thank you also to all our friends at Manchester City, especially Alex Rowan in the media department. Without you, we can't do it. We need you in order to do this. Love and kisses. <laughs>